we're going to do a quick introduction of ourselves and we're going to start with Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Soon Lee. Um, in the context of this panel, I guess it's relevant that I write science fiction and fantasy fiction and poetry, and also that I am mixed race. Um, my father was ethnically Chinese and my mother was Irish. Um, and sometimes I find it difficult to know whether that makes me Chinese enough to write Asian fiction, um, whatever that means. I mean, whatever, Chinese enough. I have things to say. Um, <laughs> Kelly. Hello, I'm uh, Fenderson Jelly Clark. I write uh, speculative fiction. There is my book that is coming out on October 13th that Michelle has up. I'm I sorry, I had it here. My will be happy. <laughs> that is my book, Ring Shout. I write speculative fiction and again, uh, my most recent uh, work that I'm going to have out is called Ring Shout, coming out on October 13th. Uh, yes, there it is. I know, really soon, right? I actually have a book coming out about at almost like on the same day, if it's a Tuesday release day. Publishers tend to release on Tuesdays um, once a week. Mm. And it's coming out in October. So, wait me, and then I'll introduce myself. <laughs> Hello, I'm Wayne. Um, I'm a speculative fiction writer based in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, all of the characters that I write are people of color. I myself am mixed race. My, my father is Togolese from Africa. Um, so yeah, I try to include all of these details in the narratives that I tell. And my most recent uh, publication is coming out, well, no, came out in the September issue of The Dark Magazine. And I'm Michelle Segura. Um, I write as Michelle Segura, I cast novels, and the new novel coming out in October is uh, a kind of related series, but it's the first book in a smaller series, one hopes. It started out as a novella, and is probably now two books, but that's me. My parents were both Japanese, Japanese-Canadian, um, so that would make me not mixed race, but very diaspora. Mm -hmm. Like a banana. <laughs> I did. What don't? Didn't you say that you, ever? Like banana, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Which was just um, for I am not Asian enough for you to exoticize. Like I don't know if you got this in school, but I got it all the time because I was one of the few Asian kids. Say something in Japanese, or better, say something in Chinese. And this would be when I was five, and I think the teachers thought that they were being helpful in some way that I still do not understand 50 years later. So I have a couple of questions because it, the panel itself is sort of broad. It's how do you present, um, no, I'll find the exact wording. Oh, no, that's okay. How do we address a more diverse cultural reference without awkward stereotypes and appropriation? Who wants to start? Uh, okay, <laughs> two, three. I really dislike sometimes the concept of appropriation. Mm -hmm. Like somehow some element of my book or what I'm writing is there for window dressing. Mm -hmm. they, it's only these signposts that are meant to indicate a type. But I, it's not something that I have been accused of to my face for what it's worth. Do, I think that you can write well, again, within your cultures, but I mean, if you point out 10 of your friends, are they all the same person? Mm -hmm. Do they all signpost the same way? Do they all feel the same things? Well, uh, no, not any 10 Asians, not any 10 diaspora Asians. Do we have elements of commonality? Yes. And if you're in Canada and you're my age, all of your parents were interned. Mm -hmm. and pretty much lost everything and then had to come out when nobody would hire Japanese people. And that didn't change till the seventies for a lot of companies. Right. So we have that common history, but very often there's a lot of um, just personal division because we're very different people. And I just like the idea that you're writing something where a character of color has to be a stand in for every single person who might share 
physical characteristics. Like, it's like, how do you even do that? So for me, always, it's the, the person as character, culture inflects and makes up the characters, but I don't know, anybody else feel any pressure from that or pressure somehow if you're, if you're writing from your own cultural backgrounds, do you have to present it in a certain way? for it to be authentic? Do you have to do certain things? Is that the responsibility that you are willing to take on in a book as a spokesperson for your culture? Is this a bad question? Everybody's so quiet. I can say I've never felt like a spokesperson for my culture because I feel like my culture is such an incredibly tiny set, you know, the set of um, people probably who grew up in London. I think I'm probably more influenced by having grown up in London than anything else. You know, people who grew up in London with Chinese, one Chinese parent and one Irish parent. And it, it's, so I don't feel I represent that, but I think you have a responsibility as an author to try to do your best, especially when you're writing about people who are not like you. And that includes mm -hmm. people of different genders, you know, if you write about someone with a disability and a disability you don't have, um, you know, in anything you're doing, you want to try and do a responsible job. But Absolutely. But you want to do something that feels true. Yeah. I just sometimes I see this kind of giant crab bucket of... Um, hmm. <laughs> there is an author who I will not mention by name um, who felt very conflicted because they were being questioned about something they had written that in my opinion did not deserve questioning, but that's me, uh, because male, white, and you know, they said, so what do I have to do here? Out my personal life and my sexuality so I'm allowed to write about this? Mm -hmm. And it, 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 there are two things that go back and forth here for me, because nobody was saying that the depiction was terrible. Mm -hmm. just that the person should never have written it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, again, I don't know how, whether or not any of you feel that, that kind of pressure. I mean, I don't feel a pressure in the sense of thinking, um, okay, what if I get it super wrong? I feel like it's more of an impression of, what in what ways can I showcase these different because I always write about people within the identities that I share so yeah but why wouldn't you I mean that's the, that's the yeah, truth that you yeah live, right yeah and for me it's more like in what ways can I explore um, this identity in ways that I haven't seen before in fiction in what ways mm -hmm. can I bring the refresh the voice right so that's really my if there's any pressure it's more like um, Your pressure. I, yeah, if there's yep. any yep. pressure, it's like, what can I bring? What What's new? What's exciting? What What haven't I seen before? Um, and and those are really my my focuses. And how can I make those voices feel like they're not represent? They're not. They're not a stand-in for everyone. They're just a specific experience based right. on this whole combination of things that are happening in the story. Um, and in terms of people writing outside of their own identities, I think, you know, just the other week, I was at um, a reading and Q&A with the Filipino writer, Leslie Tenorio. And he's a professor himself of writing. And he was talking about how, you know, if you have to just open yourself up to the possibility of being criticized and I really do right yeah you believe in that because if you don't then you're stuck writing a certain set of characters that are the same across all of your fiction and then per like it's not only what the readers are getting but also as a writer yourself how do you mm -hmm. grow if you don't explore voices that you've never explored before and I think like furthermore it gets easier it's it's become easier and easier to write fiction 
within a voice that's not your own because we have the concept of beta readers and all the time, all the time I'm seeing authors on Twitter opening up discussions saying, look, I need a beta reader, a sensitivity test reader for this book that I have coming out and I will pay you and not everyone has the resources to pay monetarily maybe, but surely some sort of agreement can, can, can come about. So I do believe in people like okay. writing yeah. outside of their identities. Yep, absolutely. So I think, I, think I, I think I agree with a little bit of everything that everyone said since um, uh, the, the baton is being passed off to me to run the final lap on, <laughs> uh, on this part. Um, I'll say this, I, I, I think all of these issues that we're talking about are tied to two things. I'll, they're tied to many things, but I'll just bring out two things. They're tied to power and they're tied to history. Yeah. Right? Um, we would not be concerned about issues of appropriation if there wasn't a history there. If there was not a history of marginalization, of othering, of stereotyping, of many people doing these things wrong or badly for so long, right? And there's a reason when we talk about power, there's a reason that there isn't a whole lot of talk, for instance, about authors getting, I don't know, cisgender white American male wrong. Uh, there, <laughs> there are reasons for that. Like, I actually you have that guy that. correctly in the, in the film. Well, yes, we, we have so many different versions of how that one character can be. Uh, that to nitpick on that would be odd. It would be awkward, right? And so I think when we talk about these terms, we have to bring uh, those things to bear. Mm -hmm. And then we have to think, when we think about pressure upon ourselves as writers, no matter who we are, I think we have to be cognizant of those things. And mm -hmm. what always floors me are writers who are not cognizant of those things. I can't possibly, like just writing about my own cultural background identity I am often thinking in the back of my mind, is this correct? I've sometimes called people up to know like, did I, did I write this correctly? Or am I stereotyping myself and my own? I've, I've done that and I've, I've had feedback, right? So I've literally sensitivity readered myself, right? Looking at different things. And so I can't imagine that someone is writing and they're stepping out of their own identity and their own culture and they're not having those same thoughts. And if they're not even aware to have those same thoughts, given the history, again, given the dynamics of power, I just find it, you have to be madly obtuse uh, yeah. to, not, uh, to not be able to think about that. And then once you think about that, as I think, I think you were just saying, well, what are we gonna do about it, right? And so we talk about beta readers, we talk about sensitivity readers. It's a great class right now called uh, Writing, Teaching the Other, being taught by uh, Tempest Bradford and, and uh, Nizzy Shaw, right? And so there are, these, there are ways you can do this, but you have, to, you have to be aware of it to begin with, right? You have to be aware of these histories, aware of these dynamics, and then you have to decide, what am I going to do when I approach this now? Are there some uh, are, are there are there some are there some places you may not want to go as a writer because of your particular identity and background? That's up to you. I know I've done that. There are some places I've gone, and there are some places I said, you know what? I don't think I have the tools and the equipment to go there right now. Right? Maybe later, but I don't have that, and I know better than trying to do it. Or I may have tried, and then I got one of those sensitivity readers, and they were no. Mm -mm. <laughs> I said, you know what? I'm going to take your word on it. I'm going to retire that to the abyss. Maybe I'll come back to it later. Or maybe I'll write about the thousand other things I could write about, right? And so uh, while I, I'm a person who believes that everyone should explore what they want to explore and they should be able to write all of those identities in anything they want, at the same time, I think it should be done responsible. And I don't think that, and I think it's, um, how shall I say? I think it's a privilege and not a right, <laughs> right? Like you don't have the right, to right simply do it, right? You were giving the privilege of doing so. And if that is the case, then you should be as damn careful and as investigative and as, I mean, down to every little thing. And again, sensitivity readers, I, I, can't, ex I can't begin to extol how well that is, how well, how well it is to have someone there to tell you, no, that's not what we eat for breakfast. In that side of the world. I know you read that somewhere on a Google in a book, but that's wrong. <laughs> right? So or it might have been true 30 years ago. Little or things you. like that. And so, and then at the end of the day, the last thing, will you, might you get it wrong? Sure. 
Mm -hmm. um, will you be criticized? Yeah, but you know, mm -hmm. just like you're criticized for anything else you write, that's mm -hmm. one of them. I don't know why people get hung up on that one little thing. They'll like, they'll be criticized about all these other things in their book, but that one little thing, people clutch their pearls and get so offend offensive, offended, right? Because even- Oh, no, 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 actually, they, they get offended by all the little things too, <laughs> all right? <laughs> they do. Yeah, <laughs> even that one sensitivity reader may not speak for everyone in that culture. Yes. Right? Right. They, so you can't use that as like, here's my good friend, right? Token <laughs> ex friend, and they said so. Well, guess what? Other folks decided that wasn't the case, and you just got to take that weight. That's just part of it. That's part of writing, right? right? You put yourself out there, you take the criticism, and then you decide, you know, maybe that criticism is too much. Maybe they're right. Let me go sit with it and let me think about this. And the next time I approach this, I'll see what will happen. But you know, let me let me sit on it. Let me go think about it. Is yeah. the absolute correct response. Don't get on Twitter and get mad about it. <laughs> I don't actually generally find that getting mad on Twitter does anything but entertain and outrage other people. But but that's me. Yeah. Um, no, that's actually it is good. The, I think sometimes people ask, "Well, how do I find a sensitivity reader?" Yeah. Um, or things like that. And I think you actually can sometimes get crit partners. Mm -hmm. who will know different things or who, you know, will come back and say they didn't have bras like that in the forties. I mean, I just, which is not, which is a different cultural, it's costumers and um, the recreationists. Information will come from different people, yeah. but. Hmm. I sometimes wonder as well uh, who your circle is in a sense. I got to say, if you want to write about this, I don't know this, you want to write about a black woman, but you like know no black women. <laughs> you know, that's going to put you in a, then I sometimes wonder, well, where are you pulling your ideas from? Cause that's interesting. Is it, is it random people you see on TV? Is it what you call it? If you have no such persons in your even outer circles, right? To, yeah. I, I, you know, cause there are a lot of places you can pull sensitivity readers from. You can, from people that you paid or are, or from people who, if they are nice enough and they want to be friendly enough, you can approach and say, hey, I think I have a relationship where I can ask you this and you can give, you can tell me this, that, or the third. Yeah. Right. I think, I think it's much easier to ask someone um, a quick, small question than it is to dump, you know, a hundred thousand words on them. Even if you might not have the means to pay, but even if you have the means to pay, asking someone to read an entire novel is a major commitment. Right. But, if you have a specific point, like what do you eat for breakfast, as you suggested, or um, how do you put a saddle on a horse, you can, you can ask someone without it being such an enormous imposition. Actually, the saddle on a horse question is a long answer. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah. But you know, you can appeal to an expert for something small much more easily than you can for or something big. The, the, I, I don't, yeah. yeah, in general, though, the, um, the cultural questions are, are not considered small. Yeah. Like, I mean, you might say, okay, what does this word mean to yes. you? In North America, when you say something is, qu somebody is, looks quite smart, yes. what does that mean? And I said, very smart. And they yes, said, yes. no, actually. Yes. That was <laughs> a hard transition. Yeah, That's sort of weird. smart. It's, <laughs> much, it's not very at all. And I thought, really? But it would never have occurred to me to ask that. And I think this is some of the problem in the old days that you have with the sensitivity things. People have stereotypes. People have information that they know. And I'm going to argue that television for people who are visual, and I am not, it's what you saw with your own eyes. Mm. So it doesn't occur to you to question what you know or what you've seen with your own eyes. So then you don't question it and then you get slammed mm -hmm. appropriately. But I think it's also where we're taking our various cues from. And, it's, and it is difficult to, because sometimes when you ask a friend, or someone who's not doing this as an editorial living, you're, you're putting the weight on them to read generally for all black people or yeah. all Hispanic people or all Japanese people or all, do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I think it's just, it's interesting because I think you have to find somebody um, who you trust mm -hmm. and listen to what they have to say and you can have them, if you have diametrically opposed styles or diametrically opposed cultural concepts or precepts, there will sometimes be pushback. But I've really seen a lot of writers 
push back when you tell them that they have no plot or when you tell them that nobody in the universe except somebody who loves you dearly is going to wade through whatever that middle section was. And of course, you'll, you'll be much politer, but they get really, really mad. So I imagine that if that it's very hard, white liberal guilt. I have a friend who says white liberal guilt makes me want to smack people. And she's, and I said, why? But actually I have come to understand why. It, it, they're, it, they're so sensitive. So if they go to a sensitivity reader and you say, you got this wrong, what they hear is you're being racist, mm. which is so not helpful. Like it's not helpful. If, if the question of race weren't involved, they might struggle to keep a lid on it more, but it depends on the personality. And as I said, I've seen authors flip a gasket uh, when someone said the pacing was off. Like it's like a personal attack that is the worst thing that ever happened in their lives. Obviously, we're not giving feedback to that person again. But it, it, I think outside in the outer community, the idea that somehow racism makes you, I don't know. It, we all have racist precepts that we grew up with, right? Mm -hmm. we, we have watched all the same media shows. We have listened to all the same dialogue. We have seen the same representations of majority, even when it doesn't really match our personal lives or our school lives or our sense of majority in the place that we are. And so untangling that is difficult. Mm -hmm. I think I'm older, so I think it's probably harder or probably I, when I was a small child, um, the Jewish people I know were hiding the fact that they were Jewish. Mm -hmm. right? there, were, there were certain Christmas things they didn't do in Toronto. But that is the 60s. And I don't think Canada was, I think that the fear of anti-Semitism was huge. I grew up with that. So I grew up Oh, and then I went to high school, it was entirely Jewish high school, and didn't realize that all of the colloquialisms I was picking up were Yiddish until university when people asked me if I was Jewish. And I'm thinking, what? So I can be a little bit dense. But I didn't, I guess we're not getting attacked. You're right. People are not coming up to me and saying, you don't understand white men. If my character's white. Mm -hmm. Yes, the power question is big there. But on some level, I think it gets a little bit not confused exactly. Um, readers read books, they respond emotionally. And reading is very solitary as an activity. And so is writing. But I don't think if they don't notice or if they're not questioning or they're not questioning in a certain way that they think of it as, mm, as being ignored, as being unseen, as being unheard. Does that make any sense? Nope. Okay, let me try it again. I think Jelly is right. If you have a bad character who is part of the visible majority, people aren't going to say he's bad because you got the majority wrong. Mm. But so it makes it much, much easier in a weird sort of way to go with completely um, vanilla if you're feeling anxious or insecure. Yeah. Um, what is it they would say? Uh, somebody write down from, I forget they use a word for an actors, right? Like uh, somebody write down from, from central casting. And I think you're right, right? When if whiteness is default in a sense, and it also is very diversified, I can find you so many different versions than I think is what many people said earlier was that a lot of weight is put on, a lot of pressure is put on this one character that's diverse, right? To stand for everyone else because there are so few, right? It reminds me, I'm, I'm a historian and there's always this big stir that happens whenever Hollywood makes a film on slavery um, because like less than 3% of Hollywood films are about slavery. So when one yeah. happens, it has to be the film. <laughs> and people spend a lot of time dissecting it in ways that they don't do other films that are historical or what have you. And one of the reasons is there are so few. If we had a ton of them, there would be less pressure. And I think if I take that analogy and I think about the issues of diversity, we have some of the same things. 
right? Um, people think like, this might be the only chance I get to make this particular character. I can go find you a, a thousand other characters who meet in a tavern with dwarves and elves, right? I, I can go into the bookstore, find you as many of those as possible. But I think I'm gonna get this one shot at making uh, this one character from this different fantasy culture. So I better make it, I better make it work, right? And so I, I think, yeah, there's that pressure there in a sense that we place on ourselves and that other people place uh, on us as writers when we do write diversely. I think that, the, that we have to place some pressure on ourselves. I mean, I, I think that that's part of the paradigm, that part of the pressure comes from the excitement of this great idea or this new way of seeing things. And boy, that excitement better carry you through the, oh my God, this book, why did I think this was a good idea? Like there, there has to be enough there that you really want to tell a story for. And yeah, I guess um, it is that somebody has a question. Do you, do you want to pop up the Q and A? If you look at the bottom of your screen or at the on the bottom bar, there will be participants. Blah blah blah. And then at the very end, it's Q and A. Or do you want me to just read the question? Maybe you should read the question because then anybody who's who doesn't get to read the question for whatever reason will hear your hear you saying it. All right. Um, when someone is exploring the voices of characters from different backgrounds. How do you think it should connect when it comes to publishing? Oh, okay, this is a slightly different question. Right now, it seems there are only a certain number of slots for various representations. So does someone who writes to learn about those other experiences have a responsibility to not try to take up those slots and use them more as a writing exercise, but not publish, at least in this current period in time? So I guess that's saying, if you try and write about a black character, are you taking away a fixed number of publishing slots that would go to, because there can only be three books about black characters in science fiction next year. I don't know, I, I'd i like to think that that was too cynical of you and that the publishing industry, especially if readers would, you know, will buy the books that are, that represent different things. I don't know, I feel it's, bleak. It's interesting to self-censor for that reason. I've, I, yeah, I've never not written something because I thought it would steal a publishing slot, I don't think. Cause, but have, I, have any of you held back from anything because you felt you were going to? Well, probably not us. I, I, I think it's an odd question, but go ahead. <laughs> Jolly? <laughs> no, he's laughing. Well, I mean, I just want to say this really quickly. If, if a book is like, if it is like we we are looking for queer writers or yeah, yeah, yeah. we're looking to do, if we're specifically focused, then certainly I self-censor myself because why would I be the jerk who would show up, <laughs> you know, and take away a slot from, a, from an anthology that is specifically about a marginalized group. Um, but otherwise, in the larger sense, um, I understand the sentiment. I've, I've heard it before. Uh, I, I can't say that I've I mean, certainly sometimes I may think it in the back of my head, but I don't know if that stops any writers from actually, once you got the idea, I don't think, I think you're shaking your head. Mom. <laughs> yeah, I can't see that back being like, yeah, I had this great idea, but nah, cause I might, I mean, <laughs> I might take a slot, but it does speak to what I was, what I think Mary points out the cynicism of what I was speaking about before about the larger problem in publishing. If you, if you think that there's only going to be a certain amount, then all these kind of ideas pop up where there are slots and everything else. And it's, it's just a, it's almost an untenable state of affairs uh, for the creative process as writers. Yeah. Yeah, because, and that's the business part, but um, I will say that publishing has a certain number of slots, period. So yeah. say they publish four books, you know, you've got the major publisher, four books a year, four books a year here, or four books a month. A year and um, I kind of never I have not ever heard like editors right now are looking for work but I don't think that that they're necessarily looking um, for quota if that makes any sense mm -hmm. I think the flip side of this is the notion of own voices right that uh, less instead of thinking it in the sense like there are only these slots then I think the real push needs to be uh, there need to be more um, voices from persons from those cultures that are accepted, right? It can't be that yes. you are, I'm going to create all these diverse books, but I'm not going to look for anybody from those cultural backgrounds to write those books, right? So I think if we flip that whole notion on the other end, I think we can be a bit more proactive in ensuring, I think like what Mary's pointing out, 
that there are more uh, diverse voices creating those diverse works, right? And then we don't, we aren't, we're not all fighting for certain slots or what have you or self-censoring. And that's all I'll say on that, yeah. Uh, there is a flip side where I've, um, I've encountered some people who felt pressured to write about the minority that they belong to, if they say it's they're a lesbian or, you know, they have a certain disability or whatever, or um, they grew up in Nigeria, they, they feel that they should be writing about that. And I think it's, it would be better if they were welcome to write about it, but they didn't feel under pressure, um, which people sometimes do. Um, again, I don't, I don't think this has applied to me because I don't think I feel like I represent enough people to feel under pressure to represent them. But I think that sometimes people do get themselves into that mindset where they think, oh, well, I, that means I have to write this. Yeah, I've definitely seen cases of that where people feel like their perception as an individual is what will carry them forward in their fiction. But I also can't relate to that experience simply because I think my cultural background is such a rich uh, resource from which I can draw all of these different narratives and, and hope because um, we're flooded by these images that don't accurately represent us, that don't speak to us, that are full of stereotypes and all of these things. I like to think that I channel everything that I've grown up with, that I absorb from my culture into producing something that falls out of those bounds. Mm -hmm. And I think certainly it is, it is a problem when, when you're trying to write your own culture and you're thinking, Am I self-stereotyping? Because sometimes, I mean, sometimes some stereotypes have roots in the truth, but how do you deconstruct these stereotypes in order, or, or I mean, full stop, if they're already stereotypes, there's no need to rehash the image, no matter what seed of truth it may have. But if you are going to include it, try to break down why it's become a stereotype, why certain perceptions of that thing um, have blown up and become the icons for that culture. And I'm just thinking concretely about how much like Puerto Ricans are, are represented by being loud or, or mm -hmm. like loving plantain food or any of these different kinds of stereotypes that like, yeah, we eat a lot of plantains, but why is this a stereotype and how can I address that? in a new way without, without really highlighting it. Because I think that's one of the problems of stereotypes is that they reduce all of the culture to this one image. And then um, instead of just having it be one detail amongst a variety of details. Right. And that brings back the conversation to like having more than one narrative that represents this group, diversifying and, and creating an abundance of narratives so that it's not just one character that stands for the whole thing. I think that may be one of the advantages you do have when you're doing your own voice. Mm. You probably no multiple. <laughs> so you, it's not like you think of a single Asian person or a single gay person. If you're in that group, you'll know enough that it's not just one image in your mind. If you decide you're going to write about something that you've no experience of and that you that you don't know many people belonging to, then it's more likely that you'll have trouble making yeah. it individual. Tom Charlie says, I'm sorry, that's why I kind of laughed. Have you ever felt hesitant to write a villain if their flaw is based in a cultural stereotype? And my my answer is absolutely. If if the what the flaw is based in the cultural stereotype doesn't sell it for me as a as a true motivation, but I, I don't think I can't even think of I've ne certainly never been aware that I was doing that, but but I may have done it without being aware of doing it, but I don't feel what about you? Do you think you've ever done it? Oh, I written a mm. villain. Well, I know that I think I think yeah, I think I don't think I've done it, but I think I've been aware. Mm. Um, if I was going to go somewhere with a character and they were going to do something villainous or be a villain, um, sometimes I might stop and say, wait a minute, 
that might have, you know, this is, this is a trope. This is a common trope. Mm -hmm. And as, as I think Michelle pointed out, we're all watching television. We're all getting these cues and there's no reason to think by the way, that a person from a, from a, a non-white background is not as impacted by those things. Yeah, we don't, have, we don't have some magic thing that stops us. We we pick up all the same stereotypes and regurgitate them in many ways, and sometimes self-inflicting and damaging ways. So I think some people think like, oh, you just a barrier, right? Certainly, if you see an anti-black stereotype, you don't pick it up. <laughs> there are there are volumes of uh, race theory and, <laughs> and race criticism that you need to read because that happens often. Yes. Um, and so sometimes I do have to think about that and I am sensitive to it. And those are the things I'm aware of. I was recent, so I'll give you an example. I'll put myself out there. Some things I'm not even aware that I'm doing. I was writing a character and um, the character uh, is, the character is, uh, I'll just say very broadly, the character is Middle Eastern. I'm using this broad term, right? And the character just, and I had a scene where the character has a sword and they're fighting or what have you, and the character uh, cuts off someone's head, right? And I'm thinking this is a great scene because the person here was spouting a lot of colonizing nonsense, right? And so in my mind, in doing this, this was an image of them like silencing it. And it's kind of done like in a bit of a joke, like, ah, I've silenced this person, I've shut them up. And that is what I'm thinking of because this person is spouting things out of an Orientalist uh, uh, fantasy, right? And it's not until um, somebody brought it up to me, they said, they said the obvious what I've seen in some people's faces. Never clicked in my mind. Never, and I said, how did it not click in my mind? I, I like tried to avoid every other stereotype and here was one slap sitting in the face that I didn't see because when I was writing that, that's not what I was doing, right? I wasn't thinking I'm doing this for this reason, my entire focus was, oh, this is my way of I'm shutting someone up, right? This is the, it's kind of a dark humor here, but this is the way of silencing uh, their thing, but never thought of the stereotype, stereotype part because I had the privilege of not having to think about that until someone brought it to my attention and I was like, oh, wow, let's, let's X that out, <laughs> right? There are, there's another way to do this. Um, and the person even said, look, you can keep it because I get what you were doing. They said, but not everyone is going to take it that way you run the risk. And I said, absolutely. Right. And I, and I came back and I came up with something different because that's why I have an imagination. That's, that's why we have imaginations, right? You, you don't have to, you can come up with something different, but all that to say, I see the wrap up thing. So yeah, I think I face that on many different fronts and sometimes I'm aware. And in that case, that one glaring case, I was blissfully ignorant. Um, in my own, is because I was zoning down on that creative process and just was not thinking. I will say that I think that there is, you do have a responsibility to think about whether your villains are disproportionately, you know, belonging to some group and whether it's a problem that they are. Um, I guess the principal villain in a book I wrote recently was a woman. And I, I mean, I do, you know, it's like, well, should they be a man because you don't want to be, you know, you can second guess yourself a lot. Yeah. Um, and it's like, where do you stop? But it helps, yeah. It helps to at least think about it and try to not be, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. I think the way that many authors sort of avoid falling into that trap of, okay, my villainous character um, is within this minority group. Um, is by having someone else who is also within that minority group and just doesn't follow the same the same narrative plot falls you know mm -hmm. um i mean it might be i don't know i've heard different takes on this that maybe this is a cheap idea but i don't think it's cheap at all because if it is a minority character then you know we have acknowledged that there is a necessity for more of these characters to exist. So why not create more characters? Why not fill your books or your narratives with characters that fall within these categories? And then the reason that we have such a breadth of different kinds of depictions of whiteness, whether they be evil or good or whatever these dichotomies are, is because we have such a variety. If we create more variety, then yes. 
we open ourselves to the opportunities of, okay, I can write a villainous character that, you know, just happens to be within this minority group. And it's not so much the minority part that takes hold, but what their actual role in the story is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it does come back to that idea of, you know, just creating more content, just, just opening up the publishing world to more and more voices that come from these communities. Yeah. You're here, I fully agree. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. The question always is um, how to get those voices out there and how to reach, and I think there is certainly a bigger awareness in publishing in my perspective now than there was before. And also there was awareness that some of that stuff will sell. Yeah. So yeah. free body problem was not a failure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the more we have that, um, the more open and the broader, I think, yes, the character things are. But I, you know, to answer that question for me, it's like, I would be very, hesitant if I only had one gay character in my entire book to make that person the villain. Yes. Right. If, yeah. To, to yeah. go back to an example that doesn't <laughs> necessarily completely yeah. encompass all of us. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's very helpful. In something book length, it's maybe simpler because you can have multiple instances. I also yeah. write short stories and poetry and flash fiction, and there you might only have two characters. So it's what you, I guess what you have to try and do is if you write 20 pieces of flash fiction to make them collectively somewhat balanced, but it, it can be hard to be fully representational. In yeah, that's, always, that's also another thing. Somebody said in the comments that they always try to make um, crowd scenes more diverse, mm -hmm. but a crowd scene is there as a crowd scene. So if you make yeah. it, diverse yet you have to you know it, it is but it's just you know the flash it's a flash of vision but we have that in real life right mm -hmm. we go into the yeah. subway we can take a look at the subway we can keep going and so you have a sense of what the city looks like um but i'm not sure that you you know you can spend a ton of time no. beyond that because that's not quite the, the purpose of the book or the character no and i think also like to <laughs> no offense but like a crowd scene that is diverse is just it's a bit superficial because you don't linger with these characters they're a blip on the screen and in if you're thinking about for example visual media yes it helps when a crowd scene is diverse because it reflects our lives but we're not attached to those people in the crowd when you sit down and you read a novel or you watch a movie, you're following all of the protagonists. Right. And in the end, the voices that stick with you and remain with you are always going to be the ones of the protagonists. You're not going to leave a movie theater and think, wow, that crowd was super di diverse. <laughs> that movie was lit. That was amazing. So yeah. for me, it just, it just falls flat because it's, yeah. it's a superficial gesture, you know? Mm -hmm. like, Thanks for the thought, but it doesn't bring anything new, I guess. Sorry. Yeah. No, my, my, my wife and I'm laughing because we have this joke we do when in television, I think it's you, this great point out movies and visual. They do this, I guess, to assure that people will see these things. We always look for that one person of color or that black friend at the normally all white wedding. And we were like, <laughs> who does that guy know? <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that Kamal from work? <laughs> like, <laughs> How do they know each other? Because they're not, they're just, they're not in the group, run and groom, they're just there, right? Like, how do they know that? Is that, is that, is, how, how do they know her? Or, or yeah. how do they know that person? What are they doing? What's their background? Do they have a family? Are they like, oh my goodness, I'm the only person of color here. This is weird. I mean, what are they thinking? And that's how that comes across. And we've made this a joke now to try to like figure out what that background, like, well, there's that one Indian guy. I wonder what he's thinking like, uh, <laughs> I wonder if he'll be in any other scene. I'm the only Indian guy for like a thousand miles. This is interesting. I don't. I didn't bring my wife with me, by the way, or anyone, or my partner. It's just me. It's just me. And so, um, oh, 
oh yeah that's exactly what i thought of and that's how that comes across it's it's so silly now it's become a joke right yeah. well yeah it, it is more than that. but it, it is tricky for me because i'm thinking oh right, that's right you need in books what you need in books is different from what you need in movies or television yeah because yeah. people are not I, I mean they're looking at the words but any of the images internally they're sort of creating themselves so right. in, that's probably been my answer somebody's last question well actually someone is asking for final thoughts from each participant um do you does anybody have something in summary that they'd like to say read more diverse books support yeah. diverse authors and own voices um uh, one creating, uh, creating diverse characters that's my yeah, thing. yeah read widely and when you're writing try to be responsible and to write with your heart but also you know some kind of conscience mm -hmm. yeah and don't use one character as the staple character that represents everything in this homogeneous way yeah, yeah because you know what i mean obviously you the the race is a fragment of a character the visual aspect is a fragment of who a person is. So I think that, yes, you want people who are writing from inside that experience so that you have, like a Mexican Gothic, there's a ton of stuff in yeah. it that is very much cultural and a ton of stuff that speaks to... A broader audience. It's the same thing, right? The things that you read, the things that you loved, you're bringing all of that into a place that is yours. You're staking out a a piece of ground. So I think your stories are important. I'd say even if you feel um, unseen, that if you write, if you draw on your own experiences in a real way, that that resonates with readers, but it also brings a new voice or a viewpoint that they might not have seen to date. That's how we make that introduction. Jelly, do you, closing statements, you said that publishing way me you I'm sorry. It's Mary. Okay. No, no, I think everybody's actually spoken. So we have like two minutes and I think um, no more questions. Well, I guess as a reader, it's lovely. The nicest thing, it's, it's so great to connect with a character mm -hmm. that's not you, you know, to have some other experience. So. But isn't that all of reading, right? Yes, yeah. it is. it's great. I and mean, isn't it great? I mean, when it works, it's just fabulous. Yeah. Well, Jane just said, oh my, one minute, would any of your answers change with respect to indigenous characters? I've seen much more, cover much more coverage of appropriation in that regard. Hmm. I mean, I don't know that my, I don't, I don't know if my answers would change because I think I we think so. have made of the same dynamics, but it would be nice to hear what an indigenous writer or creator yeah. might think. Uh, had somebody to speak to that more mm -hmm. authoritatively than I feel I can. I haven't tried to write a Native American story. That's that's all. I, but I, it would seem then again, assumptuous. I don't. I didn't grow up here. Yeah. Right. But then again, I, I guess going back to it, history. I go back to my thing: history and power. You. Everyone knows what the history is. There's a reason someone's asking that question, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone knows the history, so. If you are going to approach it, I, I, I think it's I think it's that issue is always there. I don't see that going away uh, for anyone. I think you have to take that into account. You can't simply oh, I'm just going to write this character and act like we don't have several hundred years of histories of genocide and exploitation, colonialism uh, going on behind it. I mean, no. I, that, that would be, again, maddeningly obtuse of you to do so. So, yeah. All right. Thank you both. Very, thank you all very, very much. I'm sorry if I went on too long. Um, <laughs> I, sometimes it's a difficult panel topic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You had to do several of these moderating. Yeah. So thank you. I know. Yeah. I know that the moderating makes it. Yeah. I difficult. Okay, we're, we're going. <laughs> I think we're going to be about to be booted. <laughs> I, I can be booted into the Opal Discord room. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Okay. Bye.